Our lesson tonight is in Amos chapter 4, if you'd like to turn over there. The lesson is entitled, You Have Not Returned to Me. And my first question on the lesson tonight, and I advertised earlier in the week by saying, this is going to be my coronavirus sermon. Because back in March, when all of this broke loose and we began to seclude ourselves and some churches, including ours, shut the door for a brief period of time, did it cross any of your minds that maybe this was God bringing some form of judgment to the United States? Anybody have that thought besides me? And then you stop and think, well, now, does God still do that stuff today? And maybe this is just a coincidence, and maybe it's just one of those things that happen. Because we can't look at every tornado or every tragedy and say, well, that's God's judgment. Because I think a lot of the weather we have, a lot of the sickness and disease we have, go back to the end of the paradise in the Garden of Eden, all the way back to Adam and Eve. And then on top of that, the flood that destroyed the paradise world we lived in and gives us all this terrible weather we have from time to time. So not everything that happens can be viewed as, uh, well, God's judging the nation. But if you're familiar at all with Old Testament history, then you do realize that God then and now does judge individuals, not just in eternity, but on the earth. And he also judges nations when they become so corrupt that then it's time to deal with them. And so we can never know for sure if what's going on now is something that God is using to warn us or to uh, warn the nation of America that you need to straighten up and get your act together. But certainly as we look at the Old Testament, we can see many signs of that as well. Well, the name is chapter 4 and verse 9. The Bible says, I blasted you with blight and mildew. When your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locusts devoured them, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. So we have Amos, which is an Old Testament prophet about the uh, late 700s B.C. The nation of Israel, the division of Israel and Judah, and this is the northern ten tribes. Jeroboam II was the king about that time. And what's interesting is Israel was enjoying a bountiful period of time. Their king was a good soldier, and so they had peace and prosperity, and they were very wealthy. But as we read Amos, we begin to realize that all this wealth and prosperity was not doing these people much good spiritually. And it's so very sad that often the more wealthy we become, the farther from God we wander. And that certainly was true in the case of Israel in the book of Amos. And I think it is true in America today. From the time I was a small child till now, we have enjoyed boundless wealth. And we've just gained more and more and more. And wealth in and of itself is not bad. It's not what you have. It's just be sure that you have it and it doesn't have you. But America, if we wanted to ask the question, do we deserve judgment? I would say yes. Look at the crimes that America as a nation is guilty of. The abortion that's been going on since 1973 or 4. Alcohol industry, which is only increasing more and more with the sales, the social acceptance of casual drinking, the proliferation as we have in Kansas City of everyone making their own kind of beer and their own kind of wine. And everybody accepts that as something that is good and healthy, and yet the alcohol industry is very devastating to our nation. And then we have all the many sexual sins that are going on, Forever fornication and adultery, but in the last few decades, the promotion of homosexuality, then transgenderism, and now we have violent rape on the increase. Those things are a shame and disgrace to any nation, but certainly God will judge us for that as well. And on top of that, legislating God out of the national conscience. Just ask yourself in the last six or seven months with this COVID-19 pandemic, how many times have you heard your city leaders, state leaders, national leaders say, we need to pray to God and ask for his help? Now, I live in Kansas City, which is less religious, I think, than the South, 
So while we didn't hear much of that, I did hear President Trump gather a group of men in Washington, D.C., and those men prayed for our country, but it wasn't well advertised. But I've heard very little from anybody in a place of political authority that said we need to bow our knees and pray to God. So if you've heard about that, let me know because I'd like to put that in my notes. But it's interesting to me, as I said the other night, we have legislated God out of our society and ask yourself, when's the last time you heard the word sin mentioned by anybody in a political forum? That word has disappeared from our language and yet God says it's still alive and real. And so we have to understand that things have changed and sometimes it's very subtle. But I remember back when we had the Challenger explosion Ronald Reagan prayed for the country and it was well publicized. During 9-11, President George Bush and others prayed for the country during that devastation. And now we're experiencing something along the same lines and I don't hear anybody praying to God for our country. And then on top of that, we have increased violence by murder, serial killers, severe beatings, parents being killed by children and children being killed by parents. And so with violence, we have yet more shame upon our nation. And Solomon said a long time ago in Ecclesiastes, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set on them to do evil. We see it when parents threaten their children and then never carry out the threat. The children continue to rebel and to fight and to become disobedient and rebellious. But it's because there's no consequence to their action. And Solomon said it works the same way for adults. If you don't punish people speedily for their wrong, then men just are determined all the more to sin more and more again. And yet another thing we can add to the list that I'm concerned with, and that is the extreme covetousness. Gambling has become Second nature for a lot of people. You go down to the store and you can buy a lottery ticket. You can bet on the games for Sunday, whether it's college or pro football. And nobody seems to be worried about the corruption that that would lead to. You go to Las Vegas and as they used to advertise, what goes on here stays here. And I thought, well, not really because God's got a record of all that too. But men are stealing from one another. And somebody says, what's wrong with gambling? I said, what's wrong with gambling is it is stealing by consent. Everybody who buys a ticket or everybody who's at the gambling table, they all agree to put their money in the pot, but every single one of them wants to do what? Win. Well, if you win, it's going to be at the expense of others. Somebody says, well, I don't see a problem with that. Well, let's put it in another, another scene. Suppose two men, like they did back in the colonial days in America, get into a fight and they say, well, let's have a duel. Let's take pistols. We'll each have a pistol with one bullet. We'll put our back to each other, take 10 steps, whirl and fire. And if somebody kills the other one, then so be it. And we'll settle our differences that way. You know what that is? That's murder by consent. Because man doesn't have the right to take the life of another man unless he's defending himself against a violent entry into the house. God is the author of life and he's the one that gives and he's the one that takes. So if you say, well, I can see where that's wrong, even though the two men agreed to it, one of them's going to kill the other, that's still murder. Same thing with gambling. Though everybody agreed to the conditions, the one who wins is taking money by theft from everyone else. But nobody sees it that way today in America, so we have a serious problem. But as we go back in time to the book of Amos, the nation of Israel, they had all these same problems that we have today. And I want you to see how God was angry with that nation and how he used an outsider to speak to them. You see, Amos was a sheep herder. The farm boy came to town. And the language in the book of Amos is almost comical if it weren't serious. And you'll see that as we read some of the passages. But again, God is taking a corrupt nation, a corrupt city of Jerusalem, 
and he has to bring somebody from outside society, outside the culture, to come in and to be shocked by what he sees and proclaim the condition of the nation, not as all the people saw it, but as God sees it. And that's what you and I need to remember. Sometimes you say, well, these things used to bother me, but they don't bother me anymore. I can watch an R-rated movie and see all the naked women, and that's okay. I can see lots of murder on these video games, and we just kill people by the thousands. That doesn't bother me anymore. And you know, that's the problem. It bothers me because it doesn't bother you anymore. We can become so desensitized to what is wrong that we think it's okay. And that's not the case. So how do we know? What is our standard for what's wrong? Not what everybody else is doing, not what everybody else accepts, not even what the church as a whole says, well, it's different now. The standard is God's word. It always has been. It always will be. And when Jesus said in John 12, 48, the word that I've spoken shall judge in the last day, that's what he meant. And so it's not the word that we think is to be spoken in 2020 or the word as it was spoken in 2000 or 1980 or 1950 or 1800. The word that is spoken not just in America but to the whole world through Jesus Christ. That's the standard. And our job is to not to be led away with the culture we live in and think, well, everybody likes it now so it must be okay. We have to go back and say, is God happy with us? And I've already given you a list of sins for which America deserves to be judged. They're wrong, and we continue to practice them. So let's see how Amos, the sheep herder, comes to town. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. And the first crime that he mentions in chapter 4 is these wealthy men with their wealthy wives who can't get enough riches, but they're getting wealthy at the cost and expense of the poor in the community. And listen to what Amos calls these wives. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. How would you like to be a wealthy, upper-class woman and have a sheep herder come to town and say, you big fat cow? That's what he called them. Who are on the mountain of Samaria, that's the capital city. Who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by His holiness, Behold, the days shall come upon you when He will take you away with fish hooks. You know, that's exactly how the Assyrians carried away the captives when they conquered Israel and destroyed the capital city of Samaria. So here are these fine, cultured women, and now their slaves being carried off into captivity by fish hooks. Why? Because they cared nothing for the poor, they just wanted to enrich themselves. You will go out through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her, and you will be cast into Harmon, says the Lord. When he says you'll go straight out, what he means, all the walls of protection around Samaria will be destroyed, just like they were in the city of Jericho, and you'll be carried straight out into captivity because the devastation will be that severe. So in verse 4, come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and announce the free will offerings. For this you love, you children of Israel, says the Lord God. Those words are just dripping with sarcasm. You can't live like the devil all week long and do all these sins habitually and then go to the temple and offer your sacrifice and say, Oh, how I love the Lord. He said, you love these, but the problem is, God did not. So again, we begin again at verse 6 to see the kind of calamities that God brought upon them to try to wake them up. First of all, we see in Amos chapter 4 about verse 6, that he said, I also gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and lack of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned to me, says Jehovah. So lesson number one, God brought a famine upon the cities of Israel, and that was to be a warning to them that you're doing something wrong, and therefore I'm doing this to you, and you're going to be in trouble if you don't change. 
And yet the famine didn't seem to affect them at all. It's just like, well, that happens from time to time. Well, then in verses 7 and 8, he said, I also withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not, not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. So now we try drought. Devastating when the crops don't produce their harvest and you have nothing to eat and the cupboards are bare or almost bare. When you begin to starve, don't you think that would make you think, am I right with God in case I die? But Amos is told that God says, yet you have not returned to me. Well, let's try something else. Verse 9, I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased. Your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees... The locusts devoured them, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. So we have vegetative destruction. And these things are happening one after another within a close proximity of time. And the message ought to begin to sink in a little bit. Maybe we need to repent as a nation. But God says through Amos, nobody's getting the message. You've not returned to me. Oh, they were religious. They went to the temple. They offered sacrifice, but their heart was not in it, and they were not living righteous, godly lives. And everybody was doing it. So in verse 10, he said, I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword, along with your captive horses. I made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. A plague like Egypt, you remember the Egyptian plagues, don't you? Water changed the blood, overwhelming frogs, lice, flies, livestock that had pestilence on them, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and finally the death of the firstborn. And you remember how stubborn and rebellious Pharaoh was. Each time a plague was taken away, he did not keep his word and let Israel go. Finally, when death came to the home and his firstborn son died, he said, get out of here. I'm tired of you. But even then he tried to chase them down and bring them back. You know, when I was a young man, I remember somebody saying that, you know, when things get bad, if somebody really experiences something bad, then that will soften their heart and they'll return to the Lord. So we just need some calamities. But if they thought that, they weren't studying the book of Amos because in verse 11 it goes even farther. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. That's as close to death as you can get. You're hovering over the fires of hell, and God said, I plucked you like a firebrand out of the fire, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Now I ask you, with all these warnings that God is giving to the nation of Israel, what would you do? If you were God, you know, my brother, who's about three years younger than me, we were kind of hard to raise as kids because we enjoyed a little wrestling match once in a while, like about every night around bedtime. And I blame him to this day, and he blames me. He's redheaded, and I said, you have a redheaded temper, and that started a fight. When I lived in Kilgore, Texas, I told that story. I said, you know, redheaded people have a temper. And we have a little lady, a fine lady, Carolyn Woods. Carolyn, I hope you're watching. <laughs> She's about four feet eight, and she came to me. She said, I'll have you know that redheads do not have a temper. I've got red hair, and I don't have a temper. I said, okay, Carolyn. <laughs> I told him later, I said, I think she proved my point. But David had a fiery temper with that fiery red hair, and as an adult, he had to learn to control that, and he's done great with it now. But boy, back then, it didn't take much to set the two of us off. So we shared the same room together. We were in one end of the house, and Dad was in the other end. And you know how boys do. We go to bed. We're not quite ready to get in bed and go to sleep. And so we start picking on one another. You're stupid. No, you are. Well, you're ugly. No, you're uglier. You know how that goes. And the next thing you know, somebody jumps out of bed and whack. And, of course, you can't just sit there and take it. You have to defend your turf. So you get up and you hit them back. And after a while, that little wrestling match gets louder and louder. And then dad's voice will come at the other end of the hall. Boys, 
You better settle down. And we knew what that meant. But we tried for a minute or two, and then our tempers were already hot, so pretty soon the whispering starts, and then the pushing and shoving, and then you can hear full-fledged fighting going on, and second time, Dad said, boys, I said settle down. And that was warning number two. He never gave us a third warning. And we never did learn after lesson number two. So we get back in that fighting match, and then we hear to our great horror those footsteps coming down the hall. We jumped in bed, pulled the covers over us, and hoped for, for uh, the next morning because it was going to be bad. And Dad never disappointed us. He always gave us a whipping. And then as soon as we did, we went to sleep and everything was fine. And folks, that happened probably five out of seven nights per week. You'd think there's something wrong with us, wouldn't you? But we were just being normal boys. But the one thing to Dad's credit was he never disappointed us. After that second warning, we knew what was going to come. And that's how God is here. He's given them warning after warning after warning, and they're not paying attention. And God keeps saying, yet you have not returned to me. That's what these signs are all for, to warn them that these physical calamities are actually a judgment from God, and Israel as a nation, you've wandered from God. The problem is nobody in the city thinks that uh, that applies to them. Oh, we're not that bad. So again, I ask you, what would you do if you were God? Well, what he did was he kept his word, destroyed the nation of Israel, carried the king off into captivity, all those wealthy men and women who survived the onslaught. If they weren't killed by the sword, they were carried off into captivity, and the nation of Israel, the northern ten tribes, never returned again. Only Judah was left alone to carry on the seed of Jesus Christ. And so that makes me think, well now is the COVID-19 plague a warning to America? And here's the real lesson I want you all to think. The answer is maybe, maybe not. We don't know because we don't have an inspired Amos to come tell us that's what's going on and America needs to repent. But my question is this. Do we have to know that a calamity is coming from God before we repent of our sins? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, Examine yourselves whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified or the King James Version says reprobate? One of the jobs of Christians is to examine ourselves in the light of God's Word for the very reason I've been telling you tonight, because we tend to blend into the culture and the world gets into the church instead of the church getting the world. And pretty soon we have a worldly, sinful congregation of people or individual Christians, and we don't think anything's wrong. But we're using the wrong standard. That's why Paul told the Corinthians, and they thought they were doing just fine. But one man had his father's wife, and the church was celebrating that. And Paul said, you ought to be ashamed to deliver that one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his soul might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And to their credit, they did. And then in chapter 6, they're taking each other to court. And Paul says, you've got to stop that. You can't bring brethren in front of heathen judges. That's a shame and disgrace to the congregation. And I guess they stopped that. Then chapter 7, they have marriages that are not authorized. And so there's another rebuke. And on and on it goes to the book. And here's this church at Corinth. And I've heard gospel preachers today say, Oh, well, look at chapter 1. All these terrible things are going on. And Paul still called them the saints of God in Christ Jesus. Well, Israel's doing all these terrible things in Amos' day, and they were still children of Israel, but that doesn't mean they were saved. That doesn't mean they were not in danger. And so don't let somebody pull that trick on you. In 1 John 1, 7 through 9, the Bible says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that's an ongoing process for the rest of our lives. That passage is true. We have to keep on examining ourselves, keep on practicing the doctrine of sanctification, which is the doctrine of eliminating the sinful things that we might have in our lives. And sin and Satan are deceptive. And they can fool you. And you can be looking one way, trying to keep one sin out, and another one comes in the back door. And before you know it, you're doing something wrong you didn't even realize you were. And so you have to look at God's Word and examine that in the light of what you're doing and say, now, do, does my life measure up to the standard of God's Word? And if not, then repent of it and stop doing it and ask God to forgive you. None of us are going to be perfect. That's why he said, if any of us say that we have no sin, we lie. But the habitual sin that we keep on committing and do not repent of is the one that's going to destroy us. And so Amos is telling these people, look at your life in the light of what God is saying to you. And cleanse your soul if you're necessary. And the sad truth is that most people in America will stubbornly refuse to repent and turn back to God even in the time of calamity. And that was the message of Amos in chapter 4. I've done all these terrible things to you, and yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Well, we see the same thing in the New Testament. Amos in chapter 7, verses 7 and 8 said, Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And he said, a plumb line. The Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. Now, if you're a builder or a carpenter, you know good well what a plumb line is. A plumb line is how you measure to see how straight a wall is. Gravity will make that line straight. If you attach it to something, let gravity pull it straight down. You've got a perfectly straight line. And God said, I'm putting a plumb line in Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. So when he used that plumb line to examine each one of these Israelites, if they failed the examination, they're going to die or be carried off into captivity. And the faithful few that would pass the test would be right in the sight of God, and he would take care of them providentially one way or another. But what God is saying is judgment day has come, and the plumb line is not man's think so, but God's word. And that's still true today as well. But as I've already said, impenitence is something people are very fond of in our society today. But in the sixth seal of Revelation chapter 6, when God is judging the Roman Empire, John said, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Those terms are symbolical for national upheaval. When the moon becomes black or turns to blood and there's a great earthquake, what God is saying is, I'm going to disrupt the world as it now is. And that would be a signal to Rome that they're about to be destroyed. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And notice this. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. Do you see any penitence on judgment day? And this is the judgment of the nation of Rome. The answer is no, you didn't. That's why God destroyed Rome. And again, we have the same attitude in America today. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul said, But in accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. I was talking to a young man many years ago when I myself was young and I was trying to impress upon him the fact that one day when that judgment day comes 
And it will come like a thief in the night. You won't know it's coming. There's no signs of it's coming. But one day you'll find the next moment it's here. And I said, you need to be right with the Lord when that day comes because you don't know when it will be. And his answer to me was, well, I'll just deal with that when the time comes. And I said, no, you won't. When the time comes, God will be dealing with you. All these mighty men of Revelation 6 couldn't stop the judgment day. Couldn't stop God from destroying a very wicked nation of Rome and empire. And so they simply screamed for the rocks, the mountains to fall on them because they just wanted to get away from the punishment. They didn't want to suffer the consequences of what they were doing. And again in Revelation 9 and verse 20, he goes on with the scene. And this is now the fourth bowl, another scene of God's wrath. This is the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. You see, if COVID-19 was God's judgment and a lot of people die from it, and the ones who are living don't get the message and say, we need to make sure our lives are right with God, and if America is sinful, we need to try to turn America around, then look what happens next. Revelation 16, 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. They did not repent of their deeds. Again, what do you do if you're God with people who are that hard-hearted and stubborn? Who obstinately refuse to listen to God, to recognize God, to revere and obey God. And they say, I don't care what you do to me, destroy me if you want to. I'm not going to obey. Well, the Bible tells us that God's long-suffering ought to lead us to repentance. But most people look at God's long-suffering as an excuse to keep on doing wrong. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's why God is patient and long-suffering toward us. And yet we don't seem to pick up on the message. And so what is God to do? He's to punish His people. That's what happened in Noah's day. Eight souls were righteous and everybody else was destroyed. You ever know how many people were estimated to be on the earth in the days of Noah? Those who study the genealogies, and the problem is the science isn't perfect because the genealogies aren't exactly complete. But based on what information we have, there was a minimum of 250 million people on the earth when the flood came. And eight survived. So if any of us think there's safety in numbers, think again. If anybody says, well, you and your little group who think you've got the truth and all these other churches are saying we're just fine and dandy, don't worry about it. Go back and remember Noah in his day because that's exactly what happened to the people then. And so it's a warning to us. What will we do? As I said last night, the sun that melts the butter will harden the clay. Which one are you, butter or clay? And so God's final declaration in Amos 4, verses 12 and 13, when they would not repent, was a call to the battlefield. You know, that's another thing that reminds me of my childhood. Every once in a while, you'd have a bully in the playground, and they'd pick on you and pick on you and pick on you. And if you didn't stand up for yourself, they just kept making your life miserable. And finally, when the boy being picked on had had enough, he would utter these solemn words, meet me after school. And what that meant was, we're going to get off the school ground so we won't get in trouble. We're going to have a fight. Meet me after school. That's what God is saying here. Meet me right now. Therefore, thus will I do to you, o Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind. In other words, God is omnipotent. He who declares to man what is his thought and makes the morning darkness. A God who is omniscient. Who treads the high places of the earth. A God who is omnipresent. The Lord God of hosts is his name. You know what the word Lord God of hosts means? It means the mightiest warrior with the greatest of armies. And Israel wants to fight against that? 
You know, even the most picked on child in our playground, if the bully was a lot bigger and tougher than him, you just learned to take it because if you met him after school, you're going to be put in a lot of hurt. And so keep in mind that God says, I'm omnipotent, I'm omniscient, I'm omnipresent, I'm the Lord God of hosts. Do you really want to meet me in the battlefield? And of course they didn't. But God had no recourse but to ultimately destroy the wicked, rebellious, impenitent men and women and nations. Impenitent Israel was destroyed in 721 B.C. by the Assyrians, as Amos warned in Amos 2, 6 through 16. Impenitent Judah was destroyed about 150 years later in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians and Jeremiah warned them, you're going to get what your sister nation got from Assyria if you don't repent, and they wouldn't do it. So they were destroyed for 70 years, and a very small remnant of the righteous ones came back to rebuild the nation 70 years later. But go back and read the rest of Amos, because Amos doesn't just judge Israel and warn Judah. In chapter 1, God judges the city of Damascus in Syria. In chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, he condemns the cities of Philistia, Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron. In chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he judges Tyre. Chapter 1, 11 and 12, he judges Edom. Chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, he judges Ammon. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Ammon. In all these cases, you can go back and see why God judged these nations or these cities and it's a great lesson for us today. The things written aforetime were written for our learning. And somebody says, well, that's the Old Testament. Yes, but God's moral standard of righteousness is the same in the patriarchal age, the mosaical age, and today. That never changes. Murder of Cain was wrong, or by Cain was wrong then, and murder of a fellow man is wrong today. And it was wrong under the law of Moses. Disobedience to parents involved children being stoned to death and God said children obey your parents to the Lord for this is right that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. God's moral standard has never changed even though his covenants have. And so are we prepared to meet our God? And I hope we're prepared from the standpoint of we don't want to be punished for our wickedness because in the Old Testament every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, a just recompense. Recompense means God judges you exactly according to what you deserve. And we don't want to be punished for what we deserve. I've often asked brethren in preaching, when the judgment day comes, do you want justice or do you want mercy? And I've never yet had one human being say, well, give me justice. I think I can stand on my own two feet. We all know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if we don't claim the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away our sins, then prepare to meet your God, O oh you. Because when God comes, the God of heaven, the God who is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, the Lord God of a mighty host, you're not going to stand a chance. And God is no respecter of persons, so it doesn't matter who we are, God will judge justly and fairly and righteously and the only way you and I can escape is by becoming a child of God under the cross of Jesus Christ. And so he says in Hebrews 2, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And a lot of times people are convinced, they say, okay, I'm going to obey the gospel someday, but I think I'm just going to wait a little while. Well, let me ask you this question. And young people, answer this yourself, because I remember when I was young once, as young people and teenagers, we have the mentality of being somewhat infallible. We're going to live forever. We know we're not, but we think that way. But let me ask you this, do you have a lease on life? If your soul is not right with God tonight, and you turn and walk out that building, you die in a car crash, what's going to happen to you? And if you say, I don't know, or I think I might lose my soul, then you need to make your life right tonight because you don't have a guarantee of tomorrow. You don't have a promise of another day. And young, middle-aged, or old, be sure you're right with the Lord because if you're not when you die, then all you have to look forward to is the wrath of God. Prepare to meet your God because it's too late to do anything else. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that love is greater than God's wrath. But it is a conditional love, a conditional salvation. You have to come to Jesus in faith. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Arise to walk in a new life. And promise for the rest of your life to do as best you can according to the standard that God gives you. But one thing God wouldn't do in Amos' day, and one thing God won't do today, is He will not take our free will away from us. He made us in His image. That means we have the right to choose, and our lives are our own. God will not take that away from you. But if you live a life of sin, you're going to surely die and be punished. And if you live a life of obedience, you're surely going to live and be saved eternally. But the final decision is up to you, and you're going to have to live the consequences of your choice. I think America needs to repent now. But the only way that we can get America to repent is to begin with ourselves. Begin with me. And once I clean my house up, and you clean your house up, and we clean the Lord's church up, then and only then can we reach out to our friends and neighbors and say, won't you do what I've done? Won't you follow God's standard as right and wrong and realize that God's righteous rule will last forever? And that's what we need in America today. So I hope and pray that as we leave and go back home to Kansas City, Lord willing, I'll continue to preach words like this of love, but of warning and repentance, because America needs to repent. Where we're going to be in the next few months will be determined shortly. But you and I can serve the Lord no matter whether we're in Babylon or whether we're in our homeland of Israel. So tonight, if you need to respond to the gospel in any way, I'd like to see you obey the gospel, not for my sake, not for the church here. It's your soul. It's your destiny. It's your future. I want you to be right with God. As I said at the beginning of the week, the reason I became a gospel preacher was I wanted to go to heaven, but I wanted to take as many people as I could with me. And I think every sound gospel preacher has that one motive. If I can reach one soul, then my life will have been worthwhile. Even Jesus himself said, What is a man profited if he gains the whole world and what? Loses his own soul. Or on the judgment day, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? One second after death, you'll know your eternal fate. And I hope it's the one that ends up by Jesus Christ carrying you by, well, by the angels to Abraham's bosom and the Lord saying eventually to you, well done, good and faithful servant. If you want that, then be sure you're right with the Lord. And if you're not, this invitation song is for you. And you've got to soften that hard heart and say, Lord, I humbly submit to your will. Lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake and lead me to the home of heaven after a while. I'll humbly obey and follow you. Where you lead, I will go. Won't you do that, please, while we stand and sing?